You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to day two of MadCon 2022, the only uh, convention that we know of that is strictly for audio dramas. Uh, I'm Tony, the marketing director of Fasting Nonsense, and I'm joined by some lovely people here today to talk crowdfunding, um, maybe some ad pitching if uh, if Aaron would like to, or, or, or um, product pitching for raising funds and stuff like that too if Aaron has experience with that would like to share and uh so I'm going to go around and have everyone introduce themselves and let's start with Ed hi everyone I'm Ed uh I started my creative career by building role-playing games uh so far I've published 10 different role-playing game lines uh around about 100 books in the last nine years um, I branched out into comics during that time, audio dramas, and uh, various other bits and pieces. Um, I'm the co-host of a podcast about creating called Trades of Vengeance, and I don't take any blame for that particular name. That was uh, that was my co-host's choice. <laughs> um, and I've run just about just about a hundred kickstarters at this stage wow. um i've got one active right now so uh yeah hopefully i can um give some uh uh some insight into crowdfunding in general and where to look for funds for your project awesome will you tell us a little bit about the uh, crowdfunding campaign you currently have going very interested to hear about it yeah this one's not an audio one um it is a role-playing game uh it's the latest version of one of my uh, one of my games. In fact, gosh, there we are. This is why we have camera. Uh, it's the latest version of this game here, Era Hitman, uh, where you are a super powered um, hitman, uh, sort of inspired by a cross between uh, Codename Forty Seven and a superhero universe, whereby you know you're, you're a hitman, you have to go and do your assassination. But uh, you, you have fast burn superpowers that you can use. Now, unfortunately, your target may well have fast burn superpowers as well. So uh, you sort of have to save them up and decide exactly when to use them best. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, we've learned a lot over the five years since I first published it. And it's sort of an updated and improved version of Era Hitman in the hope that we can deliver, you know, something that really helps people play the game even better than they can or could before i guess that's awesome uh so which uh you said that this is the newest iteration how many times have you um a new iteration of era hitman mm -hmm. uh so so which like number is this how many times have you been uh refining the how, how much have oh, you refined uh, the system just just this one and then the new one oh um, gotcha yeah it, after about five years, I, I revisit most of the games and just make sure that there isn't isn't something new that we can do. And, you know, is there something extra that maybe I've done in the meantime that, that can be added in? Or have I noticed some... It's a lovely opportunity to sort of deal with typos and stuff as well, to be honest. Very which nice. Which is really important. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Uh, well, congratulations on that. Um, I have linked um, the Kickstarter. By the time Thank that you you're viewing, viewing this on YouTube, this particular Kickstarter is, is probably going to be over. But for those of you hanging out here, please check that out. Please support it. Uh, it ends tomorrow, you said, believe. Is that correct? Tomorrow at uh, about two hours from now. All right, awesome. But tomorrow. Well, best of luck with that. And uh, let's move over to Erin Nicole Lundquist. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences with raising funds and the various capacities you have? Sure. Hello, I am Erin Nicole Lundquist. I am primarily a voice actor. I'm also a certified project manager. So I have my project management professional uh, as far as managing projects on a corporate side. I took that experience and applied it to my love of the entertainment world and have since produced um, one children's show uh, two podcast. I'm sorry, two audio dramas and one podcast. And I've done that primarily through private investors, creating pitches as far as like setting out budgets. Um, and I'll go, I'll go further into that in the segment. But I have not done a lot of the crowdfunding side, which is I'm excited to hear what everyone else does, and then I'm excited to contribute with like how to find 
wealthy individuals and pitch to them <laughs> to help them fund your your projects. Now, um, have you been a part of other crowdfunding campaigns aside from Supersuits, which you um, were involved with a lot of content that we did for that? That is true. So um, I have been in maybe 10 or 15 different audio dramas, all of which were crowdfunded. And I do participate on the actor side of things with helping marketing get the word out, doing little publicity events, uh, things like that, and anything I can do to help the project. <laughs> we were... And I'd love to talk about that as well, what an actor can do to help crowdfunding. I can I can definitely talk about that as well. Oh, yeah, because that was actually something that you and I spoke about a little bit in private is some of your experience with like, oh, you know, as an actor, you obviously want the project to do well because you're a part of it. And um, so there's a little bit of a um, incentive there to be like very gung ho about some of the marketing. Um, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I very much look forward to hearing about more of the corporate, like private side of things than um, uh, than what we're familiar with as like a crowdfunding campaign uh, and see where like some overlap lies. Yeah, uh, I'll try to keep it as small as possible because I want this fabulous expertise for the rest of the panel because everyone's here for crowdfunding. <laughs> like, I can't sure. wait to hear <laughs> what y'all have to say. And also currently crowdfunding is uh, Jonathan Evans, who is returning to uh, help me with this panel from our uh, one on organic marketing a little bit ago. How are you, John? Thank you. It's still quite warm here, but it's... it's oh, fun. yeah. <laughs> Having brutal heat waves right now, right? Yeah, I'd probably know. Add you in the UK. You're probably, probably feeling it as well. So it's why our curtains are shut. Um, yeah, so I'm crowdfunding for the first time for anything at the moment. Uh, so I am creator of... Uh, one of Fousey Nonsense Network shows, Gather the Suspects, uh, a cosy murder mystery comedy uh, set in a near future Wales. Uh, so this has all been a brand new experience for me. Quite, It's quite an intense experience. I think I'm just here to kind of give that, yeah, try and give that experience of what it feels like running that first campaign. Mm -hmm. And you're also a, a small business owner as well. We touched on that a little bit during the last panel and some of the... Um some of the trials that come with running a small business while also crowdfunding. And I'm sure that Ed as well can uh, attest to that um, since you seem to have quite a bit under your belt as well. Um, it sounds like you kind of run a, a small, maybe to medium business of your own too. Um, awesome. Very, well, very much on the small side, believe me. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, it's um, some great expertise here that I very much look forward to here. I've only run... Uh, with Jackie, uh, one crowdfunding campaign on my own. I have assisted my friend with helping him prepare for uh, a video game that he kickstarted for. Um, his goal was $30,000, and I think he made $46,000. Um, he does have to start paying back school loans, so he was like, if I can make eighty or more, then like I don't have to get a part-time job on top of this, and I can just make the game. But he was able to raise, obviously, a lot of money uh, and things like that, and... Uh, I, I hope I've helped him in that kind of way uh, as well. So uh, well, as we get into it, um, there is, I'm sure that um, anyone who's participated in one understands that there's a ton of prep that goes into it. Um, so I actually would like to talk to Ed about what was it like running your first campaign and kind of what have you learned about preparation in specific uh since you've started crowdfunding when did when was your first crowdfunding campaign so my first crowdfunding campaign was in 2012 okay wow uh just just about 10 years ago now um it failed completely um and that failure taught me a taught me a hell of a lot about what crowdfunding actually needs to look like um I think my number one piece of advice for anyone thinking of starting to run a Kickstarter is go go on to Kickstarter and yeah, find people who, you know, have run projects like yours, sure. That's great. Find people who've run projects like yours and failed as well. Mm -hmm. Because Kickstarter does not put those near the top. They're not easy to find. You have to spend a long time scrolling through absolutely everything for things that are that have failed 
find out what a realistic goal is and be prepared to work with that goal. Um, 30k for a video game, for example, yeah, absolutely doable. 30k for, say, an indie tabletop role-playing game, not very likely to happen. Mm -hmm. Not in most cases. So understand what it is that you're actually realistically asking for. You, you know, 3k for a, for a tabletop role-playing game, yeah, sure. Completely doable. More, yeah, definitely in some cases, depending on how big your company is. Uh, you know, ver various other factors. I'm talking about indie as opposed to uh, licensed games at this point. Gotcha. Uh, that makes a huge difference, of course. The other thing is, um, and, and this is funny, uh, I've never heard anyone else say this other than me, but if you're running a Kickstarter, expect to make roughly double what you have after 48 hours into the Kickstarter that tends to be roughly where people end up. So you'll get a big boom right at the beginning because Kickstarter puts you right at the top. Um, and every Kickstarter in every uh, area I've ever run one has basically made roughly double what happened in the first 48 hours unless some, some other factor happens. So, you know, you get a shout out by a big celebrity. Yeah, that can make a difference. Or uh, Kickstarter make you a project we love. Boom, straight to the top of the list. Mm -hmm. everyone's seeing you're you know the, ignoring those kind of external factors which are harder to control yeah that's roughly what you can expect in my experience and uh, again i can often go through sort of the list of projects on kickstarter and go i don't think you're going to make it guys um you know and, and i i sort of i have that in my mind as i go through and i'm just looking at various kickstarters mm -hmm. sort of oh dear i don't think you're going to make this one guys um so yeah um it's it's sort of how was it to run my first kickstarter it was terrifying um i i had to do a kickstarter video and at the time the only thing i could think of was to do it to camera and i'm incredibly self-conscious in front of a camera i i've i've got a lot better over the last 10 years but I began as very, very self-conscious in front of the camera. It, it probably took about 50 takes to get that <laughs> video right. Um, it's, it's very, very nerve-wracking. Um, so, you know, you're, you're trying to talk to camera, you're trying to be accurate and honest and maybe a little bit earnest, and, you know, you're asking for money at the end of the day. So you're sort of sat there, you're going, okay, uh, yeah, my project's brilliant, here's, here's why, here's why I think you should support it. And yeah, you have a script and you're trying to read the script and you're trying to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that took a very long time. And, you know, the, the good news is that, you know, if your project does fail, you can go away, you can sort of re-edit and improve it and, and change things and then come back again. You know, there's nothing that stops you from returning if, if the first time it didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. And I did exactly that. I learned, you know, my my goal was totally unrealistic. Um, I didn't really have a plan to gain support uh, in any realistic way back then. Um, I obviously didn't have an established audience because I was you know trying to get money together to create and publish the book. And yeah, I I really think that you've got to understand a little bit about what you're going to do and where these people are coming from. They don't magically appear from the ether and, and, and give money to your project as a general rule. You have to be thinking about, okay, how do I reach the right kind of people and not just hope that they stumble across it? That's, um, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head there with like, um, it's setting attainable goals is definitely a big part of it, right? What can you realistically raise based on your current audience uh, or who you have involved and things like that. And there are a lot of external factors. Um, Super Suits is a show that we raised money for um, uh, in February and March. Um, it is an audio drama. It's an audio comedy about a um, a law firm set in a superhero universe. Um, very, very ambitious project. We had uh, we have a voice cast over 50. We have many writers. We have an audio editor. We have two composers. It was a very <laughs> ambitious project. And because of the certain talent we had involved in their audience and things like that, we knew that we could have a bit of a stronger, um, 
um, base for our budget than maybe a smaller indie production. So we had a uh, we did through Seed and Spark, which is a narrative uh, exclusive crowdfunding platform, and um, they have a green light at eighty percent. So that's kind of your true goal, and then you have your hundred percent budget, which is kind of like that little bit of padding over the top. So we said, okay, well, we can do this for between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars. Um, that's what it's going to take to pay and get really high end voice actors and such as the wonderful Aaron Lundquist that is with us now. Um, and we had, because we had the likes of Jonathan Sims of the Magnus archives, uh, Ben and Tim Meredith of, uh, Stella Firma and Rusty Quill, and as well as some other, uh, Alistair, uh, Marguerite Kenner, and just a lot of like, just awesome powerhouses in the VA world. Um, we had their trust and things like that. And we were able to ask for a lot of, uh, money and we ended up raising sixteen and a half thousand dollars for our first project. And we are definitely an anomaly in that case. Not every production that you're going to go for is going to be big. Uh, sometimes you're just trying to renew a second season of your small audio drama, like uh, John is here. Uh, and so you know we worked with John on establishing a budget, making sure that he had his uh, bases covered. And so I'd actually like to turn it over to John and ask about your current experience with these first two weeks of crowdfunding the preparation you took uh, going in and kind of how you're feeling right now. Uh, I think, well, I think we did a lot of prep, I think, for this one. So, I mean, we didn't touch on it. At the start of this, we did mention, of I have a, a company of my own, which is a, a marketing company, essentially. So aside out working out kind of who the audience would be, uh, looking at kind of, Downers and then try. I mean, it was very much finger in the air at that point. But how much I thought was realistic for each tier um, in terms of pledges, worked out how we were going to kind of get to those people, and then try and put in well a proper plan and structure campaign to do it um, with different types of content sort of going out regularly. Uh, yeah, before we did anything, but it was. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I over prepared on certain things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the preparation bit was fine, but uh, with your first one, you never really know exactly what's going to happen when you press that button, I guess. So, as you said, you can spend time looking at other campaigns. I think that's what we did a lot of, was looking at who, you know, people who have been doing it recently to us. Were our expectations too much? You know, were we asking for too much? I think we are asking Indie One probably right on that top level, but we are a cozy murder mystery so we have a lot of suspects involved you know a cast is always going to be bigger than you know say a, a more kind of contained drama we have maybe sort of four or five main cast members um so you know that there is that to consider as well um when we were sort of setting that budget initially and then it's working out things as well and it goes back to what you said that you know there's a good chance that for your first one it might not work you know <laughs> because you are coming in at a blind so it's setting those contingency plans as well of you know well if we don't get this what what happens then you know we we've, we've got cast members in place already recording so you know what do we do to make that money you know from there so it, it's sort of putting some of those in at least in the back of your mind um to put in place if we need it so but it's i mean it's going okay as you said tony we, the real goal on seed and spark is basically our 80 percent goal um which is about two and a half thousand pounds um it's so about three thousand and something us dollars um we're, we're about we're coming up to sort of the halfway there we had that obviously the big surge at the start and now it's very much steady you know couple of percent every few days which would be nicer if it was a bit more um but yeah we're, we're kind of on the way i think we need to be at this stage yeah it, it, it's so funny to compare like the first day versus the second and third week right the the first day is so exciting that's when you have everyone rushing in to get their incentives especially if they're limited um we didn't have anything that was truly limited um that we actually used all up um all the slots on like we had character names right i think up to 20 character names could be claimed um and that we could create characters or at least let you name characters we had existing in our in our universe and i think well over half of those were gone and those were like the 200 um uh, uh dollar tier um and, and you know you have all this excitement at the beginning where you're like yeah you know i funded x percent like we, i think we we got 
30 something percent in the first 24 hours and that felt like amazing and then you know you get towards the end of the first week and you may get one or two pledges a day there's some days that you may not get any and like that's 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 relatively normal when it comes to these smaller scale um uh, projects and then as people are kind of you have to sometimes remind people hey it's ending in a week hey it's ending in three days and that's when they're going to start like all right let's pull the trigger let's finally do it maybe people are waiting to get paid so it's definitely uh very jarring to go from a large chunk funded to as you said trickling a couple percentage a day maybe um one of the things well one of the big adjustments for us is we Obviously, we put in that the, the content plan into place, and we've been more or less sticking to it. We rearranged a few things around, but I mean, we've always had very much an ethos of the the eighty twenty in terms of social media. We we don't really talk about our show very often. We might do one post a week where we actually say who we are, and here's a link to our stuff. The rest of the time, we spend talking about other audio shows. Um, so to go from that to them running a campaign of two, three posts a day, just purely asking for money and about ourselves was probably a really big culture shock. And I think you notice after the first kind of week as well, that the engagement on those posts dip quite considerably from the, you know, you're getting the, the 30s to 50s on the original ones, and then you're getting the, the 20s on the, you know, the end of the first week, and then you're getting three or four in the, sort of the second week. You think it does, there it there is a certain point where it does become noise. And I think that's something we we have realized is it's hitting certain beats. So you're not always we're still posting every day. You know, it doesn't matter if we're not posting necessarily about the campaign, but it is those important times when you think, well, actually, yeah, we know so this time tend to get a good engagement. So we'll post something about the campaign, but then ramping it back up towards that final week again, I think. I'd, yeah, I'd like to come back um, um, after I touch in with Aaron um, to uh, on the actual content creation itself and how do you provide content and how often do you push people um, because it does get fatiguing. So is is the strategy to target people on certain days, say, okay, we're going to push on this day, this day, this day throughout the campaign. You know, those are some of the things that we could talk about. And I'd love to hear Ed's experience with that. Um, but before that, Aaron, with the projects that you've produced and been a part of and um, on a more private side, what has been your experiencing uh, experiences with gathering funds for the projects um, you're on? Yes. So, uh, the experiences that I've had have usually come from private investors of reaching out to family members of different people that are already on a projected crew or cast, or going into a local film community, which is usually an untapped resource that I don't know that a lot of um, audio drama producers think about. But the local film community, it's pretty normal during mixers or what have have you to chat up different producers, different investors, people looking to fund stories specifically. And that's been where I've gotten two different um, projects funded uh, was from just kind of kind of strangers, but they have a list of things they've already invested in that have been successful. And that's what you're kind of looking for, those kinds of connections. Um, I have a little breakdown if you want me to post it in the chat. Actually, yeah, I would love it. That That's very interesting because that's a side of it that um, I personally haven't seen is like kind of approaching those local communities. I would see project outline. So what yeah, we have so before what, pitch. Yeah, I'll go through real, real quick. Um, the prep, like you guys were talking about Kickstarter prep. It's the same. It's the same deal. Instead of thinking of tiers and sort of what to give, the only thing that you don't have to worry about are the tiers and making ongoing content or making rewards or what have you. But as far as having your ducks in a row before you launch a Kickstarter, you have to have your ducks in a row before you pitch to an investor. And these are what you should have before you pitch to anybody uh, a basic project outline including like how big your your plan is and what i mean by that is not well i want to do this and i want to do 10 seasons and i also want to do a netflix show and i also want to do soundtracks it's like okay realistically what what do you want the money for right now 
Well, I want to make five seasons of my show. Okay, then plan for five seasons of your show. Start with season one <laughs> and see what see what happens from there. And that leads into timeline. You're going to want a master calendar, which is never, it never changes. It's like, ideally, this is when I want to release my episodes. This is how long it's going to take me to construct my episodes. Um, and as you guys know, there's a lot of pre-production before even going into release, but that will all be in your master calendar. Project calendar is just, that moves all willy-nilly. That's the daily, oh shoot, today I need to record with these two people. Oh crap, tomorrow I need to edit these two episodes or whatever. That'll change. Budget, and really think this through, because this is the part that if you lie to investors, it's like, not lie, but if you're like way off on this, it can be a problem for you. Because you kind of have to think about how many editors am I going to need? What do I want to do for sound design? Am I using stock or am I getting a sound designer to do my stuff? Um, lawyers, important. If you want to try to make sure you're protecting your intellectual property, I highly recommend having an entertainment lawyer look over your contracts. So that's something that I always recommend to my um, to my directors. How many cast members? And then just your everyday things like website hosting. Are you doing that? Are you making your own website? That still costs a little money if you want to have a fancy domain name. Then the predictions as far uh, as... Sorry, could I, oh, could sorry, I just ahead. pop yeah. in really quickly um, just on the lawyers thing? Um, yeah. It depends quite a lot which country you're in. And I'm guessing by the accent you possibly oh. are US-based. I am. Um, the legal situation is a lot different in the UK and it is different in various various countries across the world. So my advice to anyone listening is just be aware of the legal situation in your country. In the UK, when you create something, it's already your intellectual property. It's already copyright to you. You don't actually have to worry so much about a lawyer. So that's so nice. Significantly different, <laughs> and it's uh, and it's it's a it's a potential uh, uh, place where you can perhaps make a saving. Oh, it interesting. just cost me six thousand dollars to copyright baby six videos in this country. <laughs> and I technically I submitted three copyrights. It was for the two main characters, which we didn't get. We got the merchandising rights, which by the way, copyrights and merchandising rights in America are two different things and you have to do two different applications. Oh, and it Yay. took a year and a half. Okay, anyway. Yeah. Wow. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to point out that that uh, lawyers are a branch of geography. Um, so anyone listening, yes. wherever you are in the world, understand your situation because it could be different to what, what Aaron just described. That is Absolutely. so insightful and Thank so valid. You. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, for jumping in with it. I didn't even... Oh, I was... Aaron and I are and like, fuck, Aaron, should chest. we relocate? It's like... fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's fine. Um, reach. Things that you're going to want to entice investors with, which as far as like, what is your target audience? How many people are you expected to reach across how many platforms? And for that, you're going to want to do a little bit of research with similar projects uh, within that same genre and scope of what you're looking at. And then the income timeline. Is there one? Are you reaching out to advertisers? If you are, do you have people lined up? Or are you going to need to kind of do that after, after getting the initial startup Sometimes to show the advertisers, you need to have something already. So you might say, yes, we're using advertisers. These are our targeted advertisers, but we need funding in order to show the advertisers what we're going to be about, which you don't necessarily have to do, but it's a thing. And then I call it the five-year plan. It's not necessarily a five-year plan. It might be a six-month plan. If you're doing one, essentially an audio movie, it's going to have a different timeline than a six-season series. So, but but know your end goal and then have reasonable landmarks. Like, I want to do season one. I would like funding for season one. Let's see where it goes. Or, no, I want, I'm only looking for investors to invest in the entire scope of my project. And then you can obviously see where that'll be harder to find than someone just willing to invest in either a pilot or a first season. Very interesting. Okay, cool. Um I have a question then, Ed. Do you kind of consider multiple projects at one time or is are all, all your projects kind of a one and done project to project based um, production? Oh, that's sort of a two parter. Um, I'm currently working on 17 creative projects. OK, uh, that's wow. what's currently <laughs> ongoing. Uh, I am also a project manager, in fact, Aaron. So uh, um uh, pe people often ask me how on earth I can possibly do that. The answer is I 
manage my time very well. Um, so I, I, I work on a large number of projects and I work on bits and pieces, you know, things that are out with uh, an artist on one of the projects I'm working on. Um, I've got three editors working actively on, on audio dramas at the moment, uh, which we've already recorded. I'm working on writing another audio drama with, uh, uh, with a writer who's just delivered episode 10 of 10 to me. Very exciting. We're, 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 uh, we've got a sort of a, we've got a who shot Mr. Burns situation with the ending. Like we haven't decided which way it's going to go even. Oh. So we're going to record both and then decide how it comes out, which one's the real one. We thought that was a lot of fun as an idea creatively that's and, a fun like um, audience audience engagement one too because you could do like a poll leave it up to the audience and that's really cool yeah um so you know we, we, we've got we, I, i've got uh, a lot of stuff audio and otherwise going on just at the minute um in terms of one and done stuff so because partially of the number of projects i work on there's some element of i know the scope of this project is this. Um, Era the Consortium is a really good example. The white books you can see behind me. Um, the first of those white books was, was you know, a few years after I initially did it. And then I thought, well, I'd like to do some expansions. So I went and did some expansions. But again, that was a very fixed scope project. I didn't start off going, I'm going to do this and a bunch of expansions. Well, no more than every creator does because everyone's like, well, we could do this and we could do this and we could do this. And everyone wants to do all of it. Um, which is completely understandable, and that's what Aaron was saying a second ago. Um, and I think I, I think I kind of look at it and I go, right, there's this thing I'd really like to do, and I'm going to fix that scope really, really, really tightly. That's what I'm going to deliver. I'm going to do this. When I'm done with that, I'll think about whether I want to do more stuff or not. And and I've got like like folders and folders and folders with ideas. These my my notes are just yeah. <laughs> extensive um so i rather than going hey i know i'm going to do five seasons of this i won't tend to do that i'll tend to go i'm going to do a season of this i've got a longer term plan if that goes right because i'm a continuity guy and everything fits in um but i've uh two audio dramas that i've done recently uh radio free tyrannus and the titans rise um, I actually recorded double the amount of episodes that the first season ended up being, and then thought, okay, you know what, I know we've got those recorded, but I actually don't want to release it all at once. I kind of want to split that into two seasons, and then deliver it as two separate seasons, the same number of episodes. Again, sort of stuck to the scope, but sort of had that flexibility in there to do something a little bit different, because there was a natural natural story break in the middle. Oh, so, very interesting. Yeah, I, I think I think that the key to my success, anyway, is going. I there is always there are always more stories you can tell. There's always more you can do. There's no limit to how far you could take this. In theory, let's start with something. Let's do something. Let's make that happen. And then, if people are excited to see more, as excited to see more as I am to make more, we'll move on to that and then and then see how it goes. That's awesome. I think that ties, you talked about um, setting your scope and things like that. Um, and I think it's really important to consider that too. Um, and this probably will touch on more in like accessing gatekeeping, which is a panel we have. Oh, Ed disappeared on my end. Are you still there, Ed? Oh, nope. Looks like we lost Ed. Um, this I'll is more back. of... <laughs> Um, oh, there he is. <laughs> there he is, Ed. <laughs> really sorry about that. My Discord just occasionally randomly disconnects. I, yeah. I apologize. You know, mine randomly crashes, which is my favorite thing ever. Um, better than my computer crashing, which did happen uh, during John and I's panel. But <laughs> Yeah, no, I, uh, it's a thing that does happen to some Discord users. Uh, I think it's a memory leak in some versions with some versions of Windows or something. Maybe that's what caused it. But, it said yeah. memory management on my blue screen. I wonder if Discord crashed my entire fucking computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll deal with that later. 
Um, so we talked about like managing uh, scope and those kind of expectations for your project. Um, something that we talked about. You can about... tell I'm a project manager, can't you? Oh, absolutely. And I'm gonna, yeah. I'm definitely gonna take a lot of notes from you too, because I plan on being involved in a lot of, uh, not necessarily running, but assisting with a ton of crowdfunding campaigns uh, within the network. On the top of my head, there are four more just this year that we're planning on, um, and I'm gonna be helping out with in various uh, capacities. Um, but I think a beautiful part about uh, specifically audio dramas is that it doesn't take a lot to make one, but to give it the scope that you want it to have, sometimes you are going to need even a little bit of funding. It is probably one of the easiest um, creative um, creative projects you can take on in terms of, yes, technically with a phone and a computer, you can make an audio drama using your microphone. Um, but obviously it does take more than that to stand out. And something that Hannah said um, when we were talking about how to push audio dramas to the next level, what would that take? And it's, it's something she said that really resonated with me is like, she says, my wish for the future of audio drama is that resources aren't an issue because there is that bar of entry. And um, I see more and more podcasts going to uh, raising funds on whether it's Kickstarter or, uh, or another type of crowdfunding campaign to um, kind of help make their dreams a bit more, uh, may maybe make their project a bit closer to their ideal than if they did it completely grassroots with no other help. Um, so I hope this panel is going to be very uh, beneficial to those who are going on that route because I also would like to see more um, indie creators being able to make the project that they are super proud about and um, are really, really excited to show the world um so yeah it's it's awesome i want to thank you all for being here uh, again this has been this is gonna be really fun um so when it comes to on the, on the actual crowdfunding side of things uh a very important thing to consider is the benefits you're going to be giving people how do you make them feel like they either have are a part of this campaign and more so they're just giving you money how are they leaving a mark on it and to speak from my experience with super suits we did a couple things that we that we found to be uh very beneficial to our crowdfunding campaign we had an option that they could um it was a 200 dollar tier that they can name a character in the show so we'd work with them to come up with a name maybe something about them if there's like that flexibility of design and things like that um at a hundred dollars we let them about I was wondering about that when you said it before. Um, how many boaty boat faces did you get? <laughs> Not really. Like, like, uh, like, like yeah. You, uh, I don't know if anyone knows that story, but yes. once upon a time, the British government decided it would be very, very clever to let the community name a boat, and they named it Boaty McBoatface because Jonathan you know, actually has a tier called Boaty McBoatface <laughs> that lets you that lets you name you a go. character. <laughs> There you go. Uh, um, has I, anyone claimed yeah. podcast McPodcast face yet? Uh, I, I was hoping for Mystery McMystery face. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> That's part it. of the fun though of that is somebody gives you something ridiculous and then you have to try and work it into the story. And But we, the two we saw, we haven't actually had that ridiculous names actually. So, But no, I think that part of that is is kind of quite a nice give and take because if they did come up with something ridiculous, then there's going to be a really outlandish, but also not so outlandish that it doesn't fit naturally into a story way why somebody would be called that. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. um, we're a superhero I've actually had one. the other side of that. Uh, I've had the other side of that with the superhero thing. Um, I did, uh, I've, I've done several projects now uh, called Tales of the Empowered. It's set in my superhero universe. And... Um, I I had someone submit a story, uh, uh, insist that he was going to write his own story. He had written loads and blah blah blah. I sort of went, okay, all right. He delivers it. I'm like, yeah, this this is pretty terrible. Um, I'm gonna have to rewrite this. Um, and and it ended up being, you know, the, the backer got very upset. Um, I ended up actually refunding the backer. Um, because yeah, he was he was super super upset that 
you know, quite honestly, his story was not up to scratch. I was not able to, to go ahead and say, yes, I can put this in the book. You, you, you can end up in a very difficult situation there. And, and the advice I would give to anyone who's in a situation where, you know, they've offered, uh, you know, offered a Kickstarter reward, they've delivered it, someone did something ridiculous that really doesn't fit. Right. Remember, you can actually refund them their money. Right, like, like you, you, you can just sort of go, okay, you know what, I, 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 I get it. You know, you, you aren't totally aligned with what I'm trying to do here. You can just return their money, and all is good. Like, no one's gonna, no one's gonna blame you for that. Right. So, so remember that sort of that's almost like your secret weapon, as it were. And, and you can definitely put in mm. copy as well to be like, hey, you know, we will have to approve this, and that's something that we made very clear with names that mm. we weren't going to tolerate bigoted uh you know any sort of name that we're like we're not comfortable with having that in or why would you ever suggest this it's terrible um we definitely had uh, measures in place and during the crowdfunding campaign before the end of it you know we were verifying like hey what do you want to name your character these are the kind of characters we have available we can tweak some to kind of fit your description as long as it doesn't break with the continuity of the story, because a lot of these characters were pre-written, you just get the the opportunity to name them. Um, and so for us, that worked out. Um, and it, it's going to be interesting because my friend's crowdfunding campaign for his video game, uh, it's called Gremlins. It's a monster taming game, kind of similar to Pokemon. It plays more like League of Legends, where you control multiple characters, they all have powers. Really cool. Um, but the, it's all based on Grimm's fairy tales. And so there's going to be a, or, well, or classic fairy tales, not just Grimm's, but it's called Gremlins as an homage to that. Um, and there is a section where you can submit a short story. So when I donated to it, um, I will have one from the network that is the network story to put in his game. And so I can imagine that he's going to have to be a little let me edit the story or you know may have some issues with that and i am even hesitant for the same reason with uh possibly crowdfunding uh, one of our shows called lavender tavern which is a, a collection of queer short stories that are narrated um an idea i had for that is to let people write a story that would then be narrated but i now have to think about that as as a if we get to that point and it's not something we're happy with, what do we do after we've already, like if we get on the line and we've already collected the funds. So that actually gives me a lot to think about. Thank you for mentioning that, Ed. The rule I would almost never let backers actually contribute something as much as a short story, because the thing is you're, you're, you're not going to get tonally what you want. It's, it's very unlikely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you can run into all kinds of problems. People say, but this is my creation. I'd like you to follow my creative integrity because I wrote this story. So you have right. to do it this way. And, and you can end up in a lot of situations. Now, obviously, naming a character much, much simpler. Um, you know, it, it, you can just go, hey, guys, um, you know, you, you have to have a sensible name. You know, it has to, has to sound like a name that someone could potentially have. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, when it comes to other incentives, I think one of the bigger... Uh, so we had uh, at $100, you could sit behind the scenes at rehearsal and, and like a private... Uh, we did private YouTube streams so that we could turn it to private and give anyone who backed at that level or higher a link to sit in with us. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, there are people that know the ending of Super Suits and were there for that, that no one else do. It's something very private and personal we could give them without doing much more work than we were already doing. Um, and those kind of incentives, I think, are really, really awesome that they give this ability to be a part of it maybe before everyone else. Or in the case of our $50 tier, we made a one-page TTRPG, uh, Super Suits or Roll of the Dice, where basically you pick one side, uh, the defendant or the plaintiff, and then you have to kind of get to... Um, either a settlement or a trial, and there's powers involved, and there's obstacles to overcome, and Aaron is a natural at that game. We did a lot of streams with that. And I think having um, a product to immediately give them um, before anything was out. I mean, we were in the middle of writing. We were still finishing up writing the show as the crowdfunding was going. We were very early stages of this. We had no existing content to really give people, and, it was, uh, um, and I think having tiers like that really helped us um, sell the show, reach our goals, and uh, give people something immediately. Um, 
Uh, I was really surprised that you had people sit in on certain episodes that you did because the first episode I think you did, like group one, was the one with the little kids running around the building, oh, and it's a sidekick it's, episode. It's sort of a fun filler episode. Like it's not there's nothing super plot heavy that happens. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Like I'm sure it's a sitcom. There's a lot of episodes of this show that like you can show an audience beforehand and it won't spoil your story. My fear with doing something like that on any of my projects would be OBX exists. So somebody could just, or like somebody could just record their screen the whole time and then post spoilers or post your, your, your thing before your thing even happens. And um, so I was really like, Oh, I hope no bottle thing. Or, oh, I said OBX, OBS. Whatever. Yeah. It's like I was like I don't. Want, <laughs> I I would just be I would just be wary of people in narrative stories to use anything that's like content heavy as like a giveaway. I think that's something I'm gonna have to think about then if we do anything like that in the future. Is if do we limit those? Because you're right, a sitcom we do have the luxury of letting them sit on on. Um, you know, there's maybe 17 episodes that are probably mostly spoiler free, but obviously the, the last two episodes um, are a big part of a certain character development um, and obviously the season ending. So I think, I think you are right. And that is something maybe we should have considered a little harder. I think in our situation, it worked out this time. It worked out. It, it worked out this time because I didn't see anything or hear anything, but I just mm -hmm. was sort of like a, Ooh, this is spicy. It's a little dangerous. Yeah. Like living on the edge. Yeah. We, cause <laughs> like... we had, I think like three or four, like really gung ho fans in there. And, uh, you know, luckily we had, uh, we have a lot of the Magnus Archive community that's very excited for Super Suits. And if you know anything about the Rusty Quill fans, they're all voraciously hungry for anything related to Johnny Sims, Ben Meredith, and and all of them. Um, they were in there, and their lips are sealed. They're, they're our biggest fans, and they're they're so excited to, to see it come out um, as we develop it, too. So it's really, really, really been quite fun. Do you, um, Jonathan, let's talk about the incentives you've set up and some of the success you've seen with those. Do you think those are working to your advantage right now? Do you wish you had another tier or wish you could omit a tier? Uh, I would like to hear your insight on that. Uh, I mean, to be honest, our higher level tiers have worked quite well. Um, we, we also have one where people can sit in on the, the, the recordings, but we're doing it slightly differently in that we have a session coming up where it is all going to be because a lot of our show is based I we decided to write this but it's based around small audiences reacting to things which is one of the main sources of humor um we get from it so the first season obviously that was quite basic in how we did it but we are now doing that with the whole cast where we're doing fully directed reaction takes so you're not giving away too much of the plot we may be doing some pickups for different bits but then they can if they're coming along they can actually take part so we'll be doing our discord so you know we'll be directing them and they can then be an extra in the scene so we think that one's gone down quite well um similar to the the boat team at both face tier where i wish we had and i mean even from when we started designing the campaign to where we were live i mean the economy completely tanked <laughs> you know in the space of, of sort of that time and I mean, you know, we should have at the time when inflation was going really high put in something, you know, smaller. And um, one thing Tal Mania is doing really well at the moment is she's put in a $2 tier into her crowdfunding campaign. So it, there is really that nominal amount that if you really want to support something that you can. And I think our lowest is 10 at the moment. So I think one of the things we would have changed would really have that nominal amount i'm not sure with Stephen spark because i think you could just pledge anything can't you so you could in theory that's very true today if, yeah if, if i'm not right it's just not as you know, intuitive to that. do so we don't yeah people don't tend to do that mm -hmm. so oh. I, I i've got a rule of thumb uh with crowdfunding that uh you have a under five dollar tier you have a ten dollar tier you have a fifty dollar tier you have a hundred dollar tier and you have a thousand dollar tier because someone might come along and be more than happy to drop a thousand dollars on your project you better have something to give to them when they do we uh we, we did have a thousand dollar tier we so our big rule was no physical incentives because uh, as you know that sending additional physical incentives it costs money right even though someone's giving you 25 dollars if they give you $25 for a t-shirt and 18 of those is the t-shirt you've made seven dollars on your 25 dollar tier as opposed to if, postage. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and so are you shooting yourself in the foot by offering physical incentives? So the only physical I... incentive we had was our thousand dollar tier. If we're, and they were, we'll make you a custom cape. So at some point I am flying out to Colorado uh, or maybe Amy and Jackie um, and, and they're all looking to relocate pretty soon. Um, so maybe I'll be visiting them elsewhere, but, and I will go there and we will do the whole design and make the cape and send it to our three, uh, thousand dollar backers. And that's what I, um, I was part of a, for an indie film as part of a crowdfunding campaign that their $2,000 tier, you got the same vest. It was a sci-fi thing. So like the uniform that the people on the show wear, you got your own custom uniform essentially. So it's like a vest that had the badge on it. And um, that was like the $2,000 tier, but those cost about $100 to make just in materials and then the time to make them. So it's about, it would be about $200 to produce each product. But for the $2,000 tier, that's still pretty good. But yeah, you can't do it for like a $50 tier. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Got to look very carefully at that kind of stuff when you're trying to deliver it as a, as a reward. Speaking as someone who primarily produces books, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that factors into absolutely everything I do. Yeah, um, for sure. It, it's got to. Um, and, you know, I've, I've done t-shirts, I've done miniatures... I've I've done books endlessly, card games. Um, you, it's perfectly doable to do it, but um, uh, again, another rule of thumb. I'm full of rules of thumb. People will learn this. Um, your 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 tier needs to pay for the one that you're giving them, probably another one as well, and then on top of that, you also need to have profit. You know, for 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 of an amount equal to what you would get off any other sale. Right. Because if you have a if you have a hundred five dollar thank you, you get a shout out on Twitter. Um if you have a hundred of those, that's five hundred dollars of basically per profit, whatever, minus some time you took to write. Like if I'm being paid to run social media and it takes me uh you know a couple hours to write out a hundred tweets, you know, that's the only time I, that you need to take away from the five hundred dollars, um, the labor for that is very small. But if you know it's you have a hundred twenty-five dollars, like you made a lot of money. But would you have been better off just selling a thousand five dollars? You know what I mean? Um, because you would just have more profit margin that way. Um, uh, I, I really want to thank uh, Laser Melina Weber who is a member of the Double Clicks. Jackie and I took their um, crowdfunding course that taught us a lot about this, a very advanced spreadsheet to help you determine all your profit margins and how much it's going to cost, physical costs, things like that. And a lot of that didn't apply to us because we were like, no physical, but we had musicians that were in with us and one of them wanted to release like, I want to release the album on floppy disks because I'm an old school Mac nerd and like love like... <laughs> you know, early nineties, late eighties tech. And so he had to do that very intensive. If I get X floppy disks with this much memory and have the album on there and deliver it, how much is it going to cost and how much do I have to raise to actually do that? It's like the math gets really, really, really crazy. And I know that you've had to deal with that. You've been doing this for 10 years. You are probably constantly number crunching to see what makes sense. Used to it. Uh, and, and, and that's sort of, that's one of the things that I would say to anyone who's sort of looking at a first-time crowdfunding, uh, um, John included. Um, you know, uh, you 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 get used to it. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I hit the go button, and I I just kind of go and go and eat some food now. Like it's it's not actually it's not a thing where I'm just sat there going. But I remember, I remember being like that. The it's thrill just of now, the first day. I know, <laughs> I know how it's going to play out. I know what it's going to look like. You know, I, I, I know that these 15 people are definitely going to pledge within the first hour because they pledged to every one of my Kickstarters within the first hour. So I know that's happening. Right. You, you, you end up in a situation where you know what's going to happen. You, as you say, you do the number crunching automatically. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever bothered to write anything down in like my last 20 Kickstarters. I'm just like, yeah, that's an eight. Yeah, that's a 10. It, it's just kind of like, yeah, I, I know what it is. Oh, I need to go double check what the print costs are. Okay, well, it's this. Well, in that case, yeah, fine. It's, it's, that's the amount for the tier for, for a book. 
that says a lot uh, that you've been able to do this so to much it. that like you've been able to do this so much that it's just second nature to you i have a i have a lot to learn from you so i'll definitely have to keep in touch with you um <laughs> I'm very glad that. Um, how, so, how is the current Kickstarter uh, doing? Is um, how how has your success rate been since your first um, campaign, which you've you know you said you learned a lot, was it did not meet funding? Uh, how is the current one doing? How have your other ones done since then? A thing to say about Kickstarter first, quickly, is um, they don't allow you to run more than one project at once. Okay. So I had to find a way around that. Um, because yeah. uh, I want to run more than one project. Once I, I effectively have three branches of my company, I've got the games part, I've got the comics part, and I've got the audio part. Um, in theory, all of those could be running at the same time. We actually have, oh, well, we have some fans, obviously, that like everything. We, we also have some quite strikingly different audiences. So, you know, we can reach out to the audio guys and the role-playing guys, and, and they can be almost completely different sets of people with a very small crossover. So um, I've, I've run almost 100 campaigns at this point. Um, I've had four which I have have either cancelled or have failed. One of those was a Kickstarter bug that they won't own up to. <laughs> and three... Of, yeah, like, like I hit the... Su submit the project for review and it launched the project. And I'm like, yeah, that... that <laughs> I've I've done this a couple of times now. I didn't misclick, um, and um, and anyway, they wouldn't own up to that. So I cancelled that. You know, I, I I kind of went, oh shit! Uh, I had that adrenaline rush, and I I sort of went in and tried to update stuff, and I was like, I'm not doing this. It's supposed to launch in two days' time. I'm just going to copy the content of the project onto a new one. Cancel this project. Apologize to the three people who got in there in the ten minutes before I cancelled it. And just be like, guys, I'm really sorry. Something went wrong here. It, it, it went ahead. Um, uh, I've had three of them which were not funded. Uh, the first one, obviously. Um, and the other two were sort of experimental. I, I, I sort of went, okay, um, I wonder if a black and white comic can actually sell on Kickstarter. The answer was broadly no. Um, it couldn't, couldn't bring in any amount of money relative to what it was going to cost to make it. Uh, for, for a black and white superhero comic when we were known for color superhero comics. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. That's, you know, that's completely reasonable. We, we thought we'd have a go and see what happened. Get some of the manga um, fans over. <laughs> well, maybe, except for the fact that I, I, don't, I don't write manga, though. Right. So, uh, you know, it's... Yeah, anyway, so, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with giving things a try and seeing if they work, right? right? There's also nothing particularly wrong with failing. Mm -hmm. But over the years, yeah, I've I've learned what a realistic goal is. Um, I launched my current one, um, Era Hitman. Uh, I launched it with a three hundred pound goal. That's uh, what four hundred twenty odd dollars mm -hmm. give or take. Um, and I'm more than three times that at this point. I'm just coming up to a thousand pounds. Stretch goals are another thing that you have to start thinking about again. The higher you go, are you going to stop doing more work in? This one has no stretch goals. This one, rarely, I'm actually getting paid. I get paid at the end of this. Nice. Uh, normally, I just put lots of time and effort in and don't get paid anything. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, and, and in fairness, I, I, I should add, that's mostly because the money immediately gets invested in the next project because there's always another project. Right. Um, uh, and I think case, that's I'm something that... Paid. And I think that's something that a lot of people um, uh, don't realize. It's like, even though you're doing a lot of the projects yourself, like you still deserve to be compensated for yeah. your time. Just like you are asking people to join in for your projects. Um, they deserve to be, to have compensation. You also have, you know, the other people that uh, help build up the show that, you know, you should consider, you know. So when Amy, Jackie and I were talking about it, like I, I have a cost, I am an employee, but and so, like, they have my cost to cover. But they also, Amy and Jackie, have put a tremendous amount of time and effort into Super Suits. The writers have as well. And these are all things we really had to consider. It's not just about paying for the yeah. voice work and, and music. Yeah. There is more to that. It's very I tell that to, to my people, the, too. Oh, oh, no, I was just going to say, I tell that to my people, too, when they're making a mm. budget. I'm like, you exist. You are putting probably more time than anybody else. Come up with yeah. an hourly wage for yourself or, you know what, I want this percentage at the end. Like, you need to pay yourself. Mm -hmm. It's it's very easy to forget when you are the central part of a project. I, I fully agree with both of you. 
um, it's something that I would always encourage people to remember that, you know, okay, fine, I choose to invest in my next project. That's what I want to do with the money. That's cool. That's fine. You can pay yourself and then you can put it into the next project that you want to create. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, one of the interesting things that you spoke about earlier um, was about, uh, well, and, and, and uh, uh, John, you said it as well. Um, it was about uh, sort of allowing people to listen into recordings. Um, I pretty much have everything done before I go to Kickstarter. I, I should say, of those nearly 100 Kickstarters, I've basically never... Like, like I can't say never that there is one occasion which is still ongoing where, due to the pandemic, an artist has taken a very long time to deliver, uh, like, a year and a half longer than we agreed. Um, pandemic, things happen, you know, but... You know, I, 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 I very, very seldom am late. I, I can usually deliver within a month of the Kickstarter ending. Wow. In fact, nice. <laughs> the number of times I've been able to deliver before I actually got the money from Kickstarter two weeks later is, is kind of funny. Um, so, you know, again, uh, it's just a project management thing. I, I, I looked at that and went, right, I want zero chance that I am late delivering this. I can set a budget all I like, but life is uncertain. Mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do about that except make sure that you're done before you even head on to Kickstarter in the first place. Um, uh, in a lot of my audio dramas, what I do is I say to the actors, hey, guys, um, I'm not going to be able to pay you up front. What you're going to do is get a percentage of the profit from the Kickstarter. So, you know, it's going to be split based on number of lines you've done. This is the amount. Um, and it's very much going back to what uh, Aaron was saying with the, with the expectation setting. Um, this is this is the amount I expect to get from the Kickstarter based on previous experience, based on other people like us. Um, so therefore, this is the amount I would expect you to get paid. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you have to say that to them before they sort of record what they're doing because they have to understand and accept that risk. Right. Um, and, and, and as like the creator, you have to understand if they're not going to be comfortable with if it doesn't yeah. get funded. Like obviously, no one wants to put in time for for something that may not end up paying out. Um, so I think, well, I wouldn't say nobody because I'm not saying like, Oh, me. Oh, yes. Um, there's so many people who, when they fall in love with that world and they fall in love with whatever the project is, they're like, you know what? Normally I wouldn't, I'm going to do it for this. And I've gotten some, some big hefty talent that just fell in love with this concept. So I wouldn't, wouldn't knock your own worlds before you put them out there. V very, Absolutely. very good my point. Well, I, uh, I got to work with Jennifer Hale on one of my projects, which was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I love her. She's the voice of, for those who don't know, she's the voice of Samus in like Eternal Darkness. She was Alexandra, the main character. Like, Femme oh my Shep. god, she's everything. Um, Femme Shep. Femme she's Femme Shep. Femme Shep. Uh, she was uh, Captain Mar oh Miss Marvel rather in uh, in a lot of Avengers stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is the the that is the Carol Danvers Captain Captain Marvel before she's Captain Marvel. Oh, gotcha. It's complicated. That's awesome. Um, uh, yeah, no, she, she's been voice acting for almost as long as I've been alive. She's very, 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 very prolific. And she's absolutely brilliant to work with. But yeah, I, I met her at a, at a convention up in Manchester, um, handed over one of my books. She read it on the way home on the plane, emailed me and was like, yes, I'd, I'd love to be involved. Just tell me, tell me what you need. Um <laughs> And I, yeah, it was gotta do. I love that. Absolutely fantastic. It was it was really really fun, uh, really really fun working with her. And yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be said for um, as your projects are getting attention and you're meeting people, is that you do develop like relationships. Um, um, you know, I know that I can ask Aaron about a, a role or something like that, and I know Aaron likes fancy nonsense, and the, these are things that she will consider, and I. It's really fun to make these relationships through them, and then you have this kind of sense of trust from the creator to the talent, too. That you know, Aaron, Aaron says that she is happy to work with Fasty Nonsense because she trusts us, and that means a lot to us as creators. That that you would have that trust for us. So thank you, Aaron. And I think I think through crowdfunding and getting out there, there is a lot of um, talent that you can and relationships that you can build with audience and other. Uh, performers to even to enrich your projects even more you know the more excited someone is to work on something the more they're also going to want to 
um, share around the project. I mean, our biggest fans and our biggest people cheering on the project were our voice actors in Super Suits and their family. I can't, I, I can't even tell you how many of our pledges came from VA's like immediate family because it was either their first um, paid role and their family wanted to support them. Um, you know, we, uh, Aaron and I were talking about um, a voice actor named Dan yesterday. Sherry, good old Sherry, Dan's mom is like Sherry. She had like the rehearsals on downstairs, watching and everything. She was awesome. She was a huge, huge fan of the show, and, and I think crowdfunding gives you a chance because um, you know John and I were talking about how crowdfunding, uh, or sorry, that organic marketing is a very important process. People finding you, crowdfunding is a solid chance. It is a marketing campaign in its own. Um, and it is a good opportunity to build an audience. We made over, we have over 1,200 Twitter followers, and Super Suits doesn't technically exist yet. It crowdfunded and will exist soon, but it is not a currently existing product. Um, but we, because we were able to market and gain the trust from the from the people we had working with us and their fans and and friends, it was just it spiraled into this really awesome um, opportunity for us and a very successful marketing campaign. And now we have a fan base ready to go. Um, and in, in taking all of these risks, like what you're talking about, putting yourselves out there on Kickstarter, on Seed and Spark, um, or approaching voice actors, things like that, everyone's like, oh, man, but they're probably going to say no. What if they say no? Cool. What if they say yes? Like, just start thinking, like, what if they say yes to your project? What if you're, all of these followers say yes to your project what if the world says yes to your project like that's and then if if this one method doesn't work okay now you know you've learned a lot like ed had said like and pivot with that find another avenue now you can learn from that and do a different platform and there's nothing wrong with that i made a new year's resolution a couple of years back um that if the worst someone can do when i ask for something is say no then i'm obliged to do it (laughs) <laughs> that's sort of the same thing like, like, so valid like, like, if someone says no okay and you've lost exactly what 30 seconds asking right yes. okay fine next thing you know like like uh, it, it's very much supporting what, what you were saying there Aaron like like that that what okay so they said no and like like okay next person yeah or, it's or not detrimental in, in any like, way you're not like oh now uh, this person's uh, gonna go drag us on twitter for asking their you know that's not gonna that's gonna, no. not gonna happen but i think or, as creators if they do if they do that's more more attention for you that's actually yes. a positive anyway <laughs> uh john <laughs> because you know people will look at that and go why on earth are they complaining that they asked that question that's a complete, you know, they said, would you fund a, a season of my podcast? And I didn't think it was a good idea. They're like, okay. <laughs> and then people go, well, what was it? Oh, is there something crazy in it? And then they look into your podcast. Like, it's it's good publicity when people have some controversy. Don't make controversy, though. But if Don't it happens, it. But if roll it happens. with it. <laughs> uh, John, what were, you were going to, did you have something to say related to this topic? I was going back what you said about you are building networks as you go, and you, you really are. And one of the reasons when you said what Aaron was talking about earlier, when we were on our earlier panel, I was really interested because you obviously speak to a lot of people about the crowdfunding over that period. And somebody, you know, you, you'll occasionally get the person going, oh, if I give you this, what will you give me? But it's outside of that crowdfunding sphere. It is those corporate opportunities where somebody's gone, oh, Obviously, they have no background in audio drama. Don't really know what it is, but it's it's, and that's what's really interesting. Because at the time when the first person asked me that, I kind of went, ah, uh, I, I don't, I don't know, know really. Um, so it's it's being prepared for those kind of things, and the, you know, it, it's taking what Aaron's doing with the, you know, having actually what is that opportunity. So if you do get somebody almost off the back of the crowdfunding your work you're doing approaching you about something more formal and and within that corporate sphere then have that answer ready which i wish i had uh, at the time but i mean yeah that does think that but it is it's that networking bit because you're talking to people through that whole period you know they will come up that's very valid yeah su- surprise funding like i've had that happen i was i worked I used to be in the military and you're not supposed to do this. So don't, if you are in the military, don't do what I did. I worked in medical. And so people are nervous. They're going to medical appointments. So I was just chatting up people 
And this guy goes, oh, so, you know, um, what are you doing? I was getting out soon. What are you doing? Oh, I'm a voice actor. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm working on this project. I'm doing that. And they're like, tell me more. And I end up talking for like 20 minutes about one of these projects. And they're like, could I invest in that? And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up having to connect at least retired Colonel with this podcast creator and was like this. And then, I, and then I gave them materials. I was like, this is what you tell them. And this is the percentage. You have to think of a percentage of net, like net proceeds, like what the actual profit is that they'll get. So mm -hmm. the, and then is there a guarantee? Like if you invest $5,000, $10,000, $75,000, is that a guarantee that they're going to earn that back? Or is that like, but you trust us, buy, buy money, but like, we'll give you this over time, et cetera. Th th those are things that if you have that worked out beforehand, you won't get caught with your pants down when some random guy in an office goes, hey, I like that idea. I have a bunch of money I'm not using. Let's let's do it. And I feel like in this industry, that's not really something you think of because this is such a grassroots indie kind of uh, uh, sphere. Uh, but it does happen. I mean, there is there is a um, there's an audio drama that actually went and I think got a Netflix special. And I don't think the Netflix special is very good, but that was like, that is a formal business thing that happened in this industry. And those are rare. It's very, it is very rare that something in this industry hits something mainstream like that gets a Netflix adaptation. Uh, Ella Watts, who's huge in the um, UK audio drama sphere. Uh, she specifically had in a whole thread about don't make a podcast with the intent to go into Netflix because the chances of that happening are just very, very slim. But they do happen great. But you also like you have to curb your expectations. Like most of the people in here are making it because it's art. And if they do want funds, it's not because they want to be rich off of audio drama. Very few people are probably like, I want to make an empire off audio drama. We are all nerds and artists and creators. Uh, money just happens to be a thing that makes the world function and unfortunately we need it to make projects sometimes even better um and it's i would encourage i encourage my creators to think of themselves as artists and creatives and, and creative geniuses but also business people yes like you you kind of have to um because you can tell all of the stories you want but ultimately we live in a capitalist society and so if you also want to eat later <laughs> you kind of have to think with this business mindset and so while i do understand the glorification of the bohemian lifestyle and the starving artist and the you're not truly in it if you're not in this one sphere it doesn't have to be that way mm -hmm. you can set budgets that give you a good quality of life like there there are ways around and then depending on the scope of your project if the scope of your project's three hundred dollars a thousand dollars one investor can knock that out you you know it just yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I no. just don't, I just don't, yeah, I don't know that, you know, everybody's like, I'm going to make multi-billions off of audio drama. No, but you can, you can, you can make a, a decent living for yourself if that's what you want. I, I, I think um, the, 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 the main point that I meant with that is like a lot of people make podcast, talk show podcasts. I feel like with more of that in mind of I can turn this into a way of making money because I can get advertisers on where in this industry, I think more people are thinking about the art first. And then like the fact that it is a small business second, I think that is not always something at the forefront of the, the creators minds in this network. And, and maybe it should be not, not like starting audio drama. So make money, but like, if there is an opportunity that arises, all, can you be prepared for it? And was that something you would, is that an opportunity you would take? Um, so I think you're right. You, you should think about that, it. Yeah. Remember that people behind companies that you might use for advertisers um, also have interests. The random colonel in the dentist office or whatever has interests. Like your audience has interests, just like... What Ed was talking about, how he has uh, an audio division, a comic division, a games division, and that there are a few overlapping people, but they're very different audiences, so he can play to each of them. That's everyone in the world. So it's kind of finding your audience and and involving them, getting them to fall in love with your project. And that's I just think that that also applies on the grand scale to advertising to the people that you want to work with on this this level up here not you know that, that mm -hmm. was all yeah we end up 
as you know, obviously, like I am an employee. So a lot of what I think about is how can I help this make money so I can continue to work for Fasting Nonsense? We can get more like so I, I always kind of have that like I hate that I have to focus on monetization as an end goal, but that's just what comes with being a network. Obviously, if we could all just make the shows exactly what we wanted, that was an issue. That would be our utopian. Like, that would be our ideal. Like, yeah, we all just can live happily and make art, and and that is our life. But, you know, as you said, we do live in a society where that is not uh, really attainable, and we do have to consider, like, we need money to do these things in any sort of really serious or professional capacity. So, um, and that's something that I think that goes back to like crowdfunding will help you do that and then help you pay for that and things like that. Um, and, uh, things like Patreon are other ways of, um, being able to continue to do what you want to do in this. And I think that's uh, going to be a good conversation that we can have at the next panel coming up in about 30, 30 minutes. When did this one start? Oh God, the screen is so bright. Do you see that? Oh <laughs> my God. So at 145 or Eastern, no, 345 Eastern. Sorry, I'm in Central Time. Gotcha. 345 Eastern will be the non-podcast content yeah. section. 30 minutes. Yes. So we do have about 30 minutes, so we can talk about anything um, in specific we have going on. Uh, Jonathan, as, or I don't know why I keep calling you Jonathan. John, uh, so, so formal. Uh as you are currently in crowdfunding, is there any particular um, advice that you are looking for that you think that we could like brainstorm here um, to help you um, as you're almost to that halfway mark in your time um, that's right, Mike, uh, in your time on campaign? Well, almost it is, but that that thing I mentioned earlier, which is we we've kind of hit that midpoint, and everything we we think things have reached a bit of a saturation point at this stage you know so the things we post get less traction so the stuff we could be doing differently on social media potentially or different things that we could be doing to kind of get over that midpoint really i i think with because you have a current audience that may or may not all be checking Twitter all the time. I think your best way to talk directly to the people you want um, to get to is maybe, I, if I were you, if you haven't done so yet, is probably do a a halfway through the campaign update on your RSS feed. Um, you have a podcast, yeah. you know, the people that are probably waiting for news. And um, I saw your season two announcement when it went live. It did very well. And I imagine you probably got a lot of traffic from that. I think having one uh, ready to go, this, if I'm not mistaken, this Monday will be the start of the third third week. Okay, so I think that would that is a very like natural point to say, hey, it's been two weeks since we checked in. This is how we're doing so far. We are on track to green light, but we're not quite on track to meet our 100% goal or whatever the case may be. And just feel like, you know, if you we have these awesome things planned and we need your help to do it. I think being very honest and that like, hey, we need your help to make season two really work uh, is important because something that we were constantly telling people is we can't make a project as big as Super Suit without your help. There isn't a way that we could do it to the scope we have planned if we don't meet that goal. We will have to cut corners, uh, maybe trim on our more expensive cast and crew, reduce the amount of episodes, whatever the case may be. And I think being really honest with our our community made them more um, incentivized to invest in us. What about you? What, what, what do you think, Ed? I've, I've got a couple of thoughts uh, on the way you've described your, your campaign, your, your reach out, John. Um, I think, first of all, um, if I were you, I would not try and post every day about the project. Uh, like, don't even... Uh, once a week, fine. You're, 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 already talking about, you're, you're already talking about your content once a week. Just use that to talk about your project, give an update. Post as you normally would have. Post about other things. People will find it a lot less jarring. You, you, you were saying people were finding it quite. Uh, you, your engagement was dropping off, dropping off. Um, so yeah, um, you know, what, once a week is plenty to uh, you know to inform social media about how your how your project's going. Um, 
depending on the project, I may not even do it that often. Uh, it really is a, okay, guys, this is where we're at. We're going this way. Um, Tony, you're, you're, you're right, and also that can lead to, to problems. Um, so it worked very well for a first time. Very, very well for a first time. The second time that you ask people for help, they already gave you the help the first time. Uh, your your second Kickstarter is much harder to fund than your first Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. uh, your third is also very difficult. Your fourth is quite hard. By the time you get to five, you've started to figure out who your audience is and, and those people will keep coming back. But those first few times after the first time you don't get the voice actor's mum because right. it's not the first time anymore right my, my mother phoned me up and asked me how she could back my first kickstarter um she didn't she didn't phone me up and ask how she could back my second kickstarter and and it's not because she'd learned it she's not terribly computer literate <laughs> um but you know that that's that's great and you can get that the first time now some of the things I wonder about, John, is obviously this is funding your second season, but it's your first crowdfunding. So are people looking at you and going, well, why do you need money this time? Because you did it yourself last time. Um, and, and, yeah. and, and that's where some of that honesty can come in. You know, like, like okay, <laughs> and the reason I need money is, sorry. But we don't do that on social media. So we, we haven't, you know, I think we did it on the feed a bit as well. But we've not actually stated that on Twitter, for example. So we do talk about why we did it self-funded the first time and also why we're still self-funding part of it this time as well. Um, but, yeah, we, we don't talk about that enough on Twitter. So that's a really good point, yeah. Because, you know, pe people look at that and go, well, you, you were fine last time. Why can't you just be fine this time? <laughs> You know, uh, yeah, I'd kind of like to see it happen. I'd kind of like to enjoy this, but, you know, well, I mean, you, I enjoyed the first season. I, I guess I'll enjoy the second season if I don't give you any money for it. Which, which um, is, so, which is know, valid from the, a, from the, from the, from, from the um, listener's perspective. Like, that, that is very yeah. valid, valid, like, because they maybe don't understand what it takes to do what you did. Did you have to spend countless, mm -hmm. endless hours doing this all yourself and you think you could do it better with an editor mm. or something like that. Those are very I mean, important contexts that you can give. We discussed this the other day, Tony, and it goes back. I mean, there is a very different reason why we did it. I mean, it was lockdown, the first lockdown when we did the first one. Nobody had anything to do, so we had that time to do it. But I mean, we talk about because I did a breakdown of what we were using the crowdfunding for. What I didn't put was our full budget on the crowdfunding page and that to me is probably the biggest mistake i did make uh, that i did make over the campaign and we did actually get some kickback from it and again it goes back to what you said Ed, about being open and if you're saying look well this is actually how much it takes you know this is what our you know this is what our creators are putting in this is what we're paying the the you know the sound designers outside but this is what we need to top up that you're telling that story more and it's kind of bringing it all together so yeah i think if we had our time again, we totally would have done that this time. Question, because uh, I don't know. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was going to say, as a supporter, I love that. I love seeing, like, we need $1,000 for this, thousand, like, $2,000 for this. I'm like, oh, they have a plan. Yeah, I'll support that. Like, I, because I've backed quite a few different things and that's that yeah that I transparency that. is is reassuring as a consumer that your money is like is accounted for and will go somewhere and um you know you, you brought this up the other day jonathan and i and, and and i do wish like in hindsight jackie and i were like oh like yeah that maybe like we didn't even catch that either that you know that um that the you have a budget that you've already considered for part of it and what you are raising for is the voice crew um and that is not something that like we all considered as a group that it is important to be transparent about. Um, but of course, you still have time to address that and um, be transparent with that with your audience. So I don't, you know, I wouldn't be too hard on yourself because there is still you're not even halfway through the campaign yet. You got time, you know. <laughs> and and sort of that comes to what I was just just going to ask. Um, I don't know Seed and Spark at all i my crowdfunding has been exclusively relating to kickstarter i know a fair bit about indiegogo but i know nothing about seed and spark 
And and John, you you talk a lot like everything on your project is fixed. Uh, you know, like oh, I wish we'd added in a, a, a five dollar reward tier. Uh, I I I wish we could edit the project to do this. Um, are those not things that you can do during like once you've hit it? Is it just like you're stuck and you can't do anything? I am pretty sure with Seed and Spark, it is extremely rigid to where you start, you cannot stop it. I can verify but i no, think not stop it, but can you modify any of the information on the page or oh, you, we've you already modified some of the information or... um on the page to do that and i think but i think it goes back to done bits on the page but we've not then addressed that outside of the page and you know they're quite long pages you know yeah. So yeah. You, you relied on somebody then to have to go reread a thousand odd words again of the thing but um yeah, I think tiers particularly. I don't, I'm not sure you can edit. Can you tell I don't, me? I don't. I don't so believe I so. I mean, but the way Kickstarter we... works is you can't edit a tier that someone's already pledged on, but you can edit any tier that no one's pledged on, and you can also add new tiers at any time. Hmm. Oh, that's good. While we're chatting, I'm gonna peruse through. Oh, so right through John's <laughs> rewards. I, I I had another question, if I may, John, um, about your project, which was. Um, sorry, it's completely gone out of my head. Oh my god, um, that's helpful. Um, no, oh, it's it, gone. No, it's gone. John, it does look oh, like oh, you can oh. add an incentive. You can indeed add an incentive. Um, as this is, um, I've verified it now. It looks like you can just go ahead and add a three dollar incentive or whatever you want. So that is oh Jesus okay Whew. my retinas are uh, better now um, that is something that maybe that you can look at f this weekend adjusting for the second half saying hey we understand maybe ten dollars is a steep ask right now if you're more comfortable with pledging two or three dollars this is you know you can do so and then you always have if if you are confident us you can always upgrade your pledge later and maybe we could take that approach um, with it for the last half of this campaign. question i i had another question for you john which was um you're, you're talking a lot about using social media to reach out to fans uh, uh you, you mentioned uh tony the the rss feed and and so on um are you are you doing enough and i'm, I'm not asking for details particularly but are you doing enough to reach people who didn't already know about season one uh, you know, who aren't your existing followers. How, how are you reaching out to them? What what methods are you using? And are you going far enough in order to find those people? Because that tends to be a, a project that, that sort of is, you know, at 50%-ish, at, at about the 50%-ish mark, uh, you know, is... is is somewhat in trouble uh, based on my again my rule of thumb that I stated near the beginning. You're you're, you're in some trouble uh, about will you actually make that? You might make the eighty percent. Will will you make the hundred percent? You know, you you're in some trouble. You need to make some changes to what you're doing. Um, you know, are are you reaching out to people who might help you out? Are you asking people, hey? Can you can you spread the word? And I don't just mean existing fans; I mean other people. Yeah, we are, and um, we've we've also done a lot, you know, sort of further than we have. So trying to get in the newsletters, we we've, we've had yeah quite a lot of those. So that's trying to reach people who are kind of outside our things. We've done a lot of kind of direct outreach. I've done a lot of direct outreach as well. My personal network that's not anything to do with audio um to try and sort of get them to spread the word as well um yeah so there is but yeah there, there is always more you can do though isn't there it's always more you can do um if if i were you right now looking at that project i would be looking at what more i can do especially to target people who are existing audio listeners who are existing audio crowdfunders who will support projects like this rather than people at work who may or may not be interested in audio and, and you might get lucky uh like the uh like the colonel in the dentist's office uh but it, it it's relatively rare to get lucky like that um 
I, I, I have been in the same job for three or four years now. Um, I've uh, every time I do a Kickstarter, um, well, let's just say I put enough Kickstarter posts on our on our random Slack channel that I have a reputation for running Kickstarters, um, <laughs> and I've never had a single backer from work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so you know it, that's fine. I don't I don't mind. I don't particularly expect it. Um, but it is but a potential avenue that you have open. It's always worth going. Hey, does anyone listen to audio stuff? Because a lot of people listen to audio stuff. A lot of people like audio books. A lot of people don't realize the scope of what is around in the industry. And a lot of people will go, oh, hey, that person I know. Yeah, okay, they're making a thing. That's pretty cool. I'm quite interested in that. Uh, something that I th- I, I think may have helped us for Super Suits is um, every once in a while we, we'd we have a, like a kind of big update, like, hey, we're 50% there. And we'd send a message to everyone that was at that tier uh, or at well, of any of the tiers when it came to big updates like that. And, you know, as a thank you for doing this, um, if you have friends or family that you think would be interested in a project like this, you know, and if you want to keep supporting us, that is something else. That's another way that you can help us spread the word. Um, thank you for your time so far. Um, because maybe it's like, yeah, I should. I know someone that else that likes a podcast. Maybe I should tell them about it and tell them that I backed. And I'm really excited. And I like to think maybe that helped us reach our goal in some capacity as well. But again, you're asking someone to do something I the, else. I, I hate to be the cynic in the group. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in general, I've not had great success with that. Okay. Um what, what, what I have had much better success with in that vein is pose it as an alternative to backing. Right? That too, yes. As, as, you know, as you pointed out, John, a lot of people are struggling right now. Um, the cost of living, it just keeps, keeps skyrocketing. Say, hey, uh, you know, I know. I know it's really hard to find the money right now. I, you know, I'm struggling. That's literally why I'm, why I'm here doing this because it's hard to find that money. You know, I appreciate, you know, if you can't find the money, could you like share it on Twitter? Can you can you share it on Facebook? Can you can you tell people instead? Because you know you probably know someone who's doing all right, right? Yeah, you know, who's 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 got a little bit of spare. So you know, um, and, and rather than going, hey, you've already backed me. Can you now spread the word? Mm-hmm. Which I just don't find people do. Right. Um, it, it's it's almost like people sort of back you and then think, oh. Yeah, well, I've kind of done that now. Like, don't push your luck, Sonny. Right. I understand that, um, too. So, uh, one, yeah. One thing that, um, as far as reaching and reaching more people to back your project in a crowdfunding sense, I'm, I'm attributing this to reaching your audience because uh, I would not knock the ideas of Facebook groups. There's a lot of groups on Facebook out there that are specific to different genres. So like, for example, a mystery genre, a science fiction genre, and like people who are fans of like book clubs, people who might listen to audiobooks, uh, you sort of pitch it like that. Like, hey, it's like an audiobook. It's an audio play. Like maybe change your tailor your language because the people who use the Facebook platform tend to be a little bit older and they also tend to have a little bit more money than people who are a little bit younger and so that is a resource that i know audio drama you think for me i'm like oh twitter and reddit because there's a lot of activity that happens on them but facebook is where a lot of money can be found and Mm -hmm. i also recommend that for film industry when you're doing pitches and stuff you can find all these film events also facebook more than everything else Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be, and that, I'm sure that's actually, you bring that up and that's something that I'm going to bring up then in the later panel of um, bringing in people from the outside, um, which you'll be on. So actually we can talk a bit more about that too, in that vein. So it's going to be kind of late for you, John, but I'm sure that'll be fun for you to review. And I can, um, if it's late, I can always give you the cliff notes of that later as well. Oh, you're talking about the physical. I was like, it's not too late for his project. He can get his project no, no, on no, Facebook no. group. That's why I said it. Late, 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 <laughs> late in today. Physically, <laughs> yes, it will actually be late. <laughs> yes, not, it's not too late for you in Gather the Suspects. It's just late for you today. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. I didn't even uh, consider that <laughs> connotation. Uh, well, this is uh, awesome. So, uh, uh John, you and I can meet also about this, some of these items maybe early next week as well, uh, see if we can kind of come up with a midway plan 
Um, and then, you know, maybe we can um, act on some of these items we've talked about. How does that sound? I know, definitely. Okay, awesome. That's been really useful. Okay, that's good. Well, uh, I hope everyone listening who's been curious about this process um, um, has had a good time listening in. Um, for the panelists, are there any other final thoughts? Um, you are obviously um, very experienced in this field, Ed. Are there any final words of advice? Any final words? Uh, that sounded way more threatening than I meant it to be. Uh, but any, uh, any words you'd like to tell the audience or your other panelists here? Your are worthwhile there is an audience out there for it. You have to find that audience, but there is no idea that absolutely nobody wants to see. You just have to find the right person who wants to see it just like you do. And that is where a lot of that organic marketing and targeting comes from is how do you find that audience? And hopefully we can answer that question um, a little more, more specifically where uh, later when it comes to bringing people into this wonderful world of audio uh, fiction, um and it was it was such a pleasure to meet you thank you so much for all your very uh uh experience insight into this uh it was truly a pleasure you, you that that that's it's it's funny that's that's just another way of calling me old no <laughs> Exper- seasoned the seasoned crowdfunding oh, oh that's where is it that's that's worse, is that's worse? That's oh i'm worse. shooting myself in the foot here <laughs> This is the worst thank you I've ever given. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, that's all right. I'm, I'm back for the next one anyway, so you'll have another chance. Oh, okay, that's good. That's good. I was this... gonna say, but at the same time, you can go like this, and he's like, "Look at my projects that I've successfully had funded." You know, so it's it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Well, we've got about 10 minutes to the other uh, once uh, starts, so uh, this is a good time for um, Aaron. You'll be rejoining us again. If that, is that correct? Yes, I will be taking a quick break, and then I'll just turn my camera off, and I'll be right back at that for the next panel. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for everyone who will be watching this in the future. Uh, thank you for joining again. Hopefully, you learned a lot. Uh, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. Good luck on the rest of both of your crowdfunding campaigns, and uh, we'll talk more here soon. Thank you for listening to Sunday Showcase on the Mutual Audio Network. We invite you to continue the amazing audio tomorrow on Mutual with the Monday Matinee. Our weekly series of dramatic, theatrical, classic, eclectic, and live radio dramas. You can subscribe to the full Mutual Audio Network feed every day for the world's largest curated collection of audio drama. Or find the Monday Matinee feed in your favorite podcast players. See you tomorrow at the matinee, and thanks so much for listening. This is the Mutual Audio Network, where we listen and imagine together.